Ogwe Mwaura, welcome to KTN Prime. Well, it is Thursday the 30th of May, a very, very significant day for members of parliament as it became certain that their wait for higher pay will continue for much longer as the Law Society of Kenya filed a suit preventing the Parliamentary Service Commission from releasing the enhanced pay package until the case is heard and determined. Now, this is our main story tonight, but first, the highlights. The way they, are, they have reduced salaries of MPs, or they are attempting or alleging to have reduced our salaries by 57%, something that I, I don't even hap, I think happened in, in failed states, we will also reduce their budget by 15, 57%. Fighting back, MPs now threaten to paralyze budget. Missing policeman, the agony of a Garissa family. Tales from the grave, is this woman risen from the dead? And on Frontier tonight, redefining human waste. It appears that the stalemate over the MP salaries is not ending soon as members of parliament are now threatening to paralyze the operations of the country if their demand is not met. Now, despite the president cautioning them against the proposed bid, the MPs are relentless and have vowed to continue with their quest for higher pay. Our senior reporter, Aaron Ocheng, has been following up this story and now reports. The Salaries and the Remuneration Commission's tussle with members of parliament over their pay is getting a notch higher, with the lawmakers now saying they are taking the battle to the budget-making process. Members of parliament have vowed to do anything at their disposal, including blackmailing the government with threats to sabotage the passage of the budget, to push for their salary hike. Speaking in Parliament, a section of MPs did not rule out using their legislative powers to sabotage the approval of the budget to demand for what they say is rightly theirs. The commissions, which think they are too independent, will know that the way they, are, they have reduced salaries of MPs, or they are attempting or alleging to have reduced our salaries by 57%, something that I, I don't even hap, I think happened in, in failed states. We will also reduce their budget by 15, 57%. Let them work is this. The president work is this. The Ngachai work is now. Afanya kazi na yake. Itafika wakati. Na si tutakuwa na yetu wapi. Kuna musemu inasema kila umbwa inasiku yake ya mfupa. The Salaries and Remuneration Commission, together with the Commission on Constitutional Implementation, also came under scathing attack from the IRH members who say the two commissions are overstepping their mandate. They have threatened to slash budgets allocated to the two bodies starting Tuesday, when Parliament will start the budget debate. For instance, those two, a few officers have gotten drunk by power, probably, and are now intoxicated because of their misinterpretation probably of the law and the constitution we would like to have all the salaries reviewed and, re and re reduced by 57 percent Sarah Serems SRC and Charles Nyachaya CIC vowed to go to court and sue anybody who effect the salary hike by MPs and warn the Parliamentary Service Commission that it will be breaking the law if it started processing payments for MPs at the 851,000 shillings rate but as that was happening, the High Court has stopped the Parliamentary Service Commission from releasing the MPs' enhanced pay until a suit filed by the Law Society of Kenya is heard and determined. The move will mean MPs will have to wait longer for their salaries than the three months that they have gone without pay. Aaron Ochin, KTN for higher pay has dominated debate in the National Assembly. First, it was an attempt to disband the Salaries and Remuneration Commission, and earlier this week, it was a degazettement of the notice by the SRC that slashed their pay. Even though the serem led Commission has fought back and stood strong, it seems the legislators will stop at nothing when it comes to getting their pay hike. Yesterday, the president cautioned them against their push for higher salaries and told them that the constitution explicitly 
mandates the Salaries and Remuneration Commission to set and review the salaries of all state officers. What this means is that the FATA check backdated to March that they have anticipated may not be forthcoming and for the foreseeable future all state officers in the executive will have to continue or rather continue to abide by the determination of the salaries and remuneration commission it must be remembered that there are other important issues affecting the people of this country that require government's urgent attention and this should now be the focus of the national assembly rather than their salaries all said and done the president's intervention was timely and Kenyans can only hope that this voice of reason in this acrimonious battle between the SRC and Parliament will not be compromised and will continue to ensure that we get our priorities right for the benefit of all. And that's your notebook for this week. Now to the ICC and the Hague-based court is feeling the heat from the Africa frontier and now says is ready to initiate a referral of cases facing Kenya's top leadership. The ICC prosecution office has indicated that it is willing to engage Kenya legally on the country's cases, but Kenya should demonstrate it is actively prosecuting the cases against the same persons for the same crimes. Samogina reports. The ICC appears to be caving in to pressure mounted by Africa's continental body, the African Union. The War Crimes Court Chief Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda says her office is ready to engage the country on its exit plan from the Hague prosecutions. Bensouda's statement coming hot on the heels of AU's resolution calling for the referral or termination of the Kenyan ICC cases at the Hague. A dispatch from the prosecution's office states, quote, the OTP stands ready to engage in any legal debate regarding its ongoing cases in Kenya, end of quote. Nonetheless, Ben Suda says to effect a referral of the cases facing President Uhuru Kenyatta, Deputy President William Ruto and radio journalist Joshua Arapsang, Kenya must prove it is genuinely investigating the same persons for the same crimes being tried before the ICC. Despite the prosecutor's willingness to begin a legal exit strategy for the Kenyan cases from her desk, Ben Suda says a referral of the Kenyan cases can only be granted by the judges. The ICC response triggered by heat generated by the African Union, threats of mass withdrawal of all African nations, member states to the Rome stated if regional cases at The Hague are not referred or dropped. A total of 34 African nations are parties to the ICC. Braving the heat, Ben Suda's office states, quote, the Office of the Prosecutor appreciates AU's unflinching commitment to combating impunity for serious crimes, but that the only way for justice to take its course is through judicial channels, with each step decided by the judges and not by political bodies or the media. End of quote. Meanwhile, as the Office of the Prosecutor appeared to yield to pressure, the ICC presidency was talking tough. A dispatch from the court's presidency ruled out being cowed by political statements, stating, quote, the ICC operates strictly within the mandate and legal framework created by the Rome State and cannot take political factors into account, end of quote, and that the court's decisions are taken independently on the basis of the law and the available evidence and are not based on regional or ethnic considerations. Samogina Ketian, Nairobi. Certainly a very interesting turn of events and that of course forms the basis of our big question tonight. The story leads us to a big question tonight and it is, we, uh, do you support the referral of the ICC cases back to Kenya? Do you or do you not? Let's receive your responses, yes or no. Uh, and of course we shall need your comments to the number 8040 and we'll be sampling your views and of course looking at your results later in this uh, newscast. Now tension is high in Garissa town following another explosion last night that left one man dead. The deceased is believed to have been planting an explosive device targeted at the military and police officers 
on patrol when it detonated. This, as the family of one of the officers based in the region, appeals to government to help locate him. The officer is thought to have died during an attack by Al-Shabaab in Liboi and the Kenya-Somalia border last Saturday. The area at which the blast took place has been cordoned off by police. Notably, it's only 200 meters from where three Kenya Defense Forces soldiers were shot and killed earlier this year. The death of the soldiers prompted a swoop by military officers, an operation that has gained criticism that military officers are abusing human rights. It is believed that some Garissa residents are harboring those who organize and carry out these constant attacks in Garissa, which usually target police and military officers, as was the case on Wednesday night. One man was killed during the blast that took place at about 9.30. Police believe that he was planting the device when it went off. Following the blast, a committee has been formed to oversee the creation of a 50-man vigilante group in the volatile town tasked with improving security in Garissa. The team will be headed by Abdullahi Salat. The committee was however clear that their mandate was simply to complement efforts already in place by government security personnel who will be in plain clothes and will be assisted by the youth in monitoring the security in the town. Last Saturday, at least 60 Al-Shabaab militiamen attacked two AP camps in Liboy district, killing five people, two of them police officers. It is not clear if Fancy Churcher's husband Frederick was one of those officers killed. <laughs> Fancy wants the police in Liboy to help her find her husband, dead or alive. Catherine Omwando, KTN. President Uhuru Kenyatta suspended Justice Joseph Mutava following recommendations by the Judicial Service Commission. The president has also formed a tribunal to investigate claims leveled against the judge. The JSC had recommended that a tribunal be set up to investigate his conduct on three counts of impropriety which could lead to his dismissal from the judiciary. The judge was indicted on two grounds of interfering with the judgment of two other judges and favoring Golden Park scandal mastermind Kamlesh Patni. The members and mandate of the tribunal will be disclosed once the names are gazetted. The judge can opt to resign from the judiciary to avoid the panel. In our other stories we are following for you today, a family in Kieni West in Yeri County is in shock and disbelief after one of their kin they believe they buried 10 months ago resurfaced on Sunday. Now, 21-year-old Grace Wanjiko is said to have died on January the 1st this year following a road accident along the Nyeri Nanyuki Road near Naro Moru Township and was buried on January the 23rd. Catherine Romanzo brings him more. Grace Wanjiko is supposed to be dead and buried. That is according to her family. They assumed that she was involved in an accident 10 months ago, but evidently their assumptions were far from the truth. According to Anjiko, a mother of two, her marriage was on the rocks and she therefore decided to look for a job in Nyeri town where she became a waitress in a hotel. Her husband had taken away her mobile phone and she says there was no way she could communicate with her family. According to Anjiko, she had only memorized the telephone number of a friend who she has been talking to since she moved to Nyeri. Mimi na sisi tulisikia hiyo mambo ata yako hai tulisituka sana. Ah tukaenda Nyanyuki pale alikuja ili tumshukue tumleta nyumbani kwa sababu tunamshika kama mtoto yetu. The question is who is in Wanjiko's grave? Sisi tukamua tukaamua. Ndio tulikuchukua mama au hapa na korongo. Tako wa goma. This incident comes only a day after a family in Makuyu buried an empty grave. Hatujapata jambo kama hili katika kijiji chetu hiki cha Muranga area hii ya Mukoyo. Lakini tunaomba Mungu ya kwamba kutapatikana njia. Kwa sababu mzee ambaye yako hapa, babake Martin, 
na mama yake na hii jamii wamevunjika moyo sana kwa kile kitendo mana walikuwa tayari kwenda kuzika ule mwili the family of the late martin chege opted to bury an empty coffin after martin's body was disposed of at the kenyatta national hospital on the pretext that the family did not have enough money to claim the body tukarudi tu kungangana kwa soshi waka wanembe nenda utafute pesa nenda utafute pesa mwisho waka nipatia credit au soshi waka sasa hiyo credit nikapewa niwe nikilipa hizo pesa zimebaki elfu mia elfu tatu na miatano kila mwezi na kanembe nenda nichukue mwili mochari ni nenda nizike sasa lakini nitakuwa na deni yao ya elfu ya elfu mia mbili na sabini na tisa na tuka kubaria na hivyo na tuka andikania na nikaenda tarek ishirini na nane kuchukua mwili huko katika mochari ya kenyata kuenda huko sasa siku pata mwili nilipata tayari wa mezika bila ifini yangu 19-year-old Martin Chege's bizarre funeral and burial will be the talk of Makuyu village for days to come. Catherine Omwando, KTN. Bizarre, but uh, should be misinterpreted as uh, superstition or witchcraft. These things just happen. And of course, we go to your weekly feature, the frontier. In many rural homes, the latrine is the most preferred and viable way of human waste disposal. However, limited sewage collection mechanisms, contamination of water wells, and other factors have raised fresh questions on the sustainability of the latrine. However, in Kwale, a school appears to have found an answer. A toilet built to enable the recycling of waste disposal and the urine for farm use. Our senior coast reporter Ferdinand Domondi looks at the Echo Sun toilet in this week's edition of Frontier. Pupils of Darad Montessori Academy in Ukunda line up to do their thing at the school toilet. In normal circumstances, they would have nothing to do with what they have dropped here again. But in this case, their stool and urine will be reused at the farm that produces their food. This is an ecological sanitation toilet, the Ecosan. We are talking of part of using of the product in the farm to reduce the cost of buying fertilizer. Unlike many ecological latrines that only recycle stool, the Ecosan toilet also recycles urine for farm use. This is achieved by separating the stool from the urine. Separation is done from the stool and the urine, known as U UDDT, the urine dehydration diversion toilet. A typical UDDT has two chambers. One chamber collects the urine while the other collects the stool. The toilet relies on natural science to achieve this objective. Assume you have closed your door. You are doing now your business. The long stool goes perpendicular. The urine is collected at that angle. Be it a lady or a gentleman. The calculation of the two passages does not go the urine does not go perpendicular with the stool so the urine is collected here where it goes to the tank only stool paper tissue or leaf is allowed in the stool chamber anything else is a contaminant care must then be taken for those who use water instead of tissue we have the washing tub there for our brothers the muslims so after their business the, the long business they do the cleaning on the other side. This water is taken to the sock pit. To facilitate collection, the Ecosan toilet has three feet tall chambers as opposed to the deep holes associated with latrines. After a long call, ash is sprinkled on the contents of the chambers to prevent smell and also absorb liquids. Each toilet has two chambers. When one is full, the chamber is closed for six months to facilitate further decomposition as the other continues operation. The end product hardly looks any different from the common compost manure derived from domestic animals. This human manure is an alternative for the DAP normally used in the planting season. The process of recycling urine is much more direct. 
After the short call, the urine is directed to these tanks via pipes. When a tank is full, it is closed and left alone for six months. During that period, the acidity in the urine declines and the end product, we are told, is liquid calcium ammonium nitrate, which is very ideal for growing plants. A spot check at the school farm where they purely use human manure appears to give solid evidence of its effectiveness. The farm is replete with different species of vegetable, all looking very green and healthy. So do the young popo trees and even the bananas where the manure is used as top dressing. The Ecosan toilet was introduced to Ukunda by the German chapter of Engineers Without Borders who are seeking alternatives to the pit latrine which has proved a health hazard for nearby wells and boreholes. And in pit latrines, this water at the borehole is being contaminated by the passage of urine and feces from the latrine. So at the end, when there is an outbreak, you find the whole community will be affected, but this is reduced by the Ecosan toilet, whereby there is no any contamination, there is no any absorption of urine to the soil. The Ecosan toilet is also lauded as environment friendly since its contents are not disposed of but recycled. What's more, it saves money in the long term. The Rad Academy now saves on the cost of waste collection or having to build new ones every time a latrine fills up as is the norm in rural Kenya. Now we can imagine of having maybe like schools where we have the government school 1,000 or 2,000 pupils in a school. How many toilets will they construct latrines every day? You find after one year the latrine is full, another year the latrine is full. If they mean or if they now depend on emptying the latrines, you find they will be using a lot of money. The biggest challenge for this project, however, is acceptance. Unlike Western Kenya, where several such toilets are in wide use, it took a lot of convincing before the project Ecosan could begin here, where the dominant religion is much more conservative. Hata sisi wenyewe, pia kwanza kabla tuelimisha tulikuwa tunakataa. Maike ni kitu kigeni ambayo atuja uh, kiona wala kusikia. Na ilikuwa ni hivyo hivyo pia kwa majirani. Several seminars later, and now the Darad Academy fraternity is reaping the rewards of the Ecosan toilet. Not only have they broken the circle of sanitation-related disease, their waste is a major player in producing a healthy crop for the food they eat. The healthy crop in this farm is a demonstration that the Ecosan toilet can be a new frontier in human waste disposal in the rural areas. Not only does it ensure that waste does not waste more resources, it also turns that waste into a resource. Ferdinand Mundi, Kate Kunda, Kuali County. It's the 30th of May. Thank you for keeping it. KTN, my name is Joy Doreen Bira. Time for business. Members of Parliament have issued a raft of measures under the clamor of easing the cost of living in the country. While this decision remains welcome, the timing and the process of enacting the measures may not be feasible. Adelaide Chingole explains why. Just two weeks before the reading of the national budget, Parliament has unveiled a series of tax changes that it says will make the life of the common monainchi easier. We are now, as a Parliament, looking for innovative ways of making life bearable to Kenyans. Because I think that is the agenda that is being put forward. Among the measures include an increase of minimum taxable wage from 11,000 to 50,000 shillings so as to protect those in the lower income bracket. The MPs also want to reduce value-added tax by between 4 to 6 percent, to reduce the cost of goods and cut fuel taxes so as to reduce the cost of transport. We will make sure that these five years, Mama Mboga is living very comfortably. The youth are living very comfortably. Those who are paid less are living very comfortably. However, the timing of the initiatives seems suspect, especially given the public backlash MPs faced over their spirited attempt to raise their salaries. Even then, the parliamentarians said they would be presenting the amendments on the floor of the House on Tuesday next week, once the public hearing on the budget estimates, which are currently underway, running through Monday next week, are over. The rate of VAT is too high. We can lower it. 
Parliament will do it. The income tax. Why should someone earning less than 50,000 pay tax? Reducing the cost of living is a noble undertaking, but the MPs must tread carefully on this issue since the government needs those taxes to fund development programs and meet its debt obligation. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business Today. And well, all eyes are on the National Treasury to see exactly where uh, this is going to happen in terms of reducing the cost of living. In more business, the Parliamentary Committee on Agriculture will convene a meeting on Monday to discuss the woes of National Cereals and Produce Board. Committee Chairman Ayub Savula says the meeting will be attended by the management of the board as well as government representatives to find a way of repaying the 500 million shilling date that has crippled the operations of the cereal board. We are going to have an urgent meeting on Monday to sort out the problem facing national cereals and produce board. Yesterday when we were in a meeting with the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, they are still Permanent Secretaries, um, uh, briefed us on the crisis, but today it has deepened more. And this is going to apply to, uh, to affect the fertilizer supply. We are supposed to receive the CNN fertilizer between June 10th and June 15th. The fertilizer has already delayed. Somalia is open to investments. This is the message the Somali government is putting out after decades of civil war. The Horn of Africa country says it needs investors to help it restore its shining glory. Here's the report. Practically there is no structure, uh, infrastructure is gone. Fuel infrastructure in Somalia is really poor. This is Somalia years back. Drought, famine and self-destruction best describe this nation that today is rising above the rubble. We have to start from scratch. Uh, the recent assessments that we carried out in December informed us that uh, still there, are, there is one million people in Somalia who is uh, in food security crisis and 212,000 children under five are malnourished. The journey towards a new Somalia started with the political beat being sorted out as it elected a new president. The next step now is economic which must start with attracting investors to take up the opportunities available. We need more banks in the country. We need regional and international banks to be there right next to other local uh, financial institutions. With world records of piracy being the hallmark of this spot city, investors can now look forward to the new administrations offering relief. Infrastructure even at the uh, other ports uh, still uh, in bad shape. For Somalia, reconstruction is key and this will mean going all out to its neighbors like Kenya to ask investors to partner with it in building a new image far from its known nature of a failed state. All right, it's now time for KTN Sports Today. I am Nicholas Mudimba. The Kenya Rugby Union met today to discuss, among other things, the upcoming Rugby Sevens World Cup in Moscow and future plans of the game, among other issues. And discussion was the competition of the National Rugby Sevens coach, Mike Friday, who arrived in the country on Wednesday, but was known at the Sevens team training at the KRU this morning. Victor Gale attended the team's training session and filed the following report. <laughs> The journey to the Rugby World Cup started for the Kenyan Rugby Sevens team soon after the RB series, where Kenya finished fifth overall. <laughs> the National Rugby Sevens team has now adopted a new training pattern with one rest day per week. And this, according to their handlers, will help them achieve their target come the Rugby World Cup. Mike Friday, whose time as the Kenyan coach, comes up for review after the World Cup was not present during the Thursday session, which was handled by his assistant Felix Ocheng and the fitness coach Chris Brown. Ocheng says all resources have been directed to the team to ensure a good performance in Russia. Just to shock the body, you know, to get it into that match mode, to that physical mode. And you know it's a World Cup, so we're trying to get them both toughened up. Kenya is in Pulsi with Zimbabwe, Philippines and Samoa. Kenya met and defeated Samoa in the final leg of the just concluded series in London. To be fair, still focusing on the fundamentals, doing them well, making sure that we remain in structure um, and the boys are confident 
in what they have confidence in what they're doing and confidence in uh, what's going to come up against them, you know. All the players are in top shape, something that could be the technical bench's headache. I think it's a big call to the coach because everybody's available for this World Cup and every player is very in his top form at the moment. I think it's a big call for him to make at the end of the day, yeah. It's obviously a very difficult for, for us as coaches to choose uh, because the summer have performed really, really well of the season. I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to the players to put up their hands and say, you know what, I'm ready. The Rugby World Cup will kick off on the 28th of June in Moscow, Russia. Victor Ogale, KTN Sports. All right, we told you about transfer news and gossips, and as you can see in your screens, we have Mark Hughes has now been confirmed as a Stock City manager, and his main motive will be to prove critics wrong. And next, we will be having uh, Jose Mourinho, confirmed Chelsea's coach, will be unveiled next week, and he'll be the coach for £40 million pounds for a four years deal. It's been coming. Next, we'll be having... Um, Julio Cesar is being targeted by Arsenal, the QPR goalkeeper is being targeted by the Gunners and will be hoping to maintain his 70 million, 70,000 pounds, which is 9.6 million shillings a week. And of course, next up we'll be having uh, David Luiz, might be following Rafael Benitez to Napoli. He'll be the first target for Benitez in Napoli. And lastly, we're having Bayern Munich Football Club. is the most valuable club right now in the world after winning the uh, UEFA Champions League and is now valued at £570 million, pounds, which is £71,769,600,000, which is at least their Kenya shillings and currencies, which can, of course, keep our economy at another level. That's all.